There we go. All right. Okay. So we are Jeff and Katie Whiteside, and we operate a website called frostygarden.com. And how this all started is we moved uh, from Montana to Fairbanks in 2015, and we were avid gardeners, and we wanted to learn how do you garden in the subarctic. And we were struck immediately that there was very little public information on extreme cold climate gardening and doing things in zone two and, and so on and so forth. And so when we started our gardening experience here, we started basically a blog that was intended to journal our experience. Um, that has kind of morphed now into a uh, essentially a very uh, focused uh, website on many different cold climate gardening topics, off-grid gardening, uh, container gardening, focusing on a lot of the different techniques that, that will benefit gardeners in the north. Um, so we've been operating now for eight years or so, uh, and it's continually grown, and, and uh, we're also on social media. So what we want to talk about today is how we kind of operate our seed starting process. We grow hundreds of our own garden starts every single year and basically do everything from seed. We barely grow or barely buy any plants at all. So um, we do focus on indoor guard, uh, seed starting and not things like, um, you know, planting in milk jugs and putting them outside. And the reason we do that is because we, uh, it's universal across all different kinds of plants. You can grow onions, you can grow squash that way, you can grow every different kind of plant when you, when you do your seed germination in, indoors. Um, so we're going to talk about some of the tools that we use and basically the uh, the methods that we uh, leverage because we've got some generally pretty good ideas. Um, so the first thing I kind of want to do is introduce you to our, our basic seed germination kit. So this is how we uh, do our seed germinations and what this is is a 1020 tray which is at the very bottom. Then we have a humidity dome, which is how you increase humidity and, and prevent seedlings from drying out too quickly. And then we use a 200 cell seeding tray. And basically, this is how we germinate all of our seeds in almost all cases. There are some exceptions, which we'll talk about. But basically, I'm going to introduce the equipment and then we'll talk about how we use them. Then we also have uh, some inserts. And you, if you've ever bought plants, you know what these are. You can buy these all around town. Um, and we like this size. This is called a 606 jumbo insert. And this would be a 1206 insert. And the way that works is basically the first numbers are the number of, of inserts that you can fit into a 1020 tray. And the second number defines how many plants are in each insert. So there's lots of different sizes. We really like the jumbo inserts. And the reason is, is that it allows the plants to root very, very well. It also reduces drought uh, requirements. We're not a greenhouse, right? We don't have staff. So using a larger uh, container in your transplanting process will reduce your labor and qu requirements. And when you're growing hundreds of garden starts, that's really important. We also use a couple different size pots. This is a three and a half inch pot, and this is a five and a half inch pot. What's interesting about three and a half inch pots is that 18 of them will fit perfectly into a 1020 tray. With a five and a half inch prop, you can get uh, eight different uh, pots into a single 1020 tray. We really like these 1020 trays because they are uh, very heavy duty. We buy heavy duty trays and these are from Bootstrap Farmer. Uh, they have nice colors that you can get, um, so you can color coordinate things and put warmer climate crops and colder climate crops in colored trays so you can easily identify your plants. Uh, but they're very heavy duty, even with fully loaded, uh, you know, a full set of fully loaded plants all wet, these trays will hold up. And so we do recommend heavy duty trays. So that's kind of the, the basics of our seed germination equipment. And we're going to talk, dome, uh, we, I guess we talked about the humidity dome. Uh, so this is basically, it sits on top of your seating tray or uh, it could be your inserts or anything here. Uh, and it basically increases the humidity, which is really good for seedlings. So you, it's really important that you uh, retain that moisture because if your seedlings dry out, they're very quickly susceptible to drought conditions and having further problems. These have little vents at the top, so you can adjust the amount of, uh, I guess, escape of moisture that comes from those. 
Um, so we're, I want to talk now about kind of how we utilize and how we go through the germination process. So again, we start everything in these 200 cell uh, trays. These are typically used by larger greenhouses, but we've settled on this method because it makes things very, very easy for us. And we'll talk about why. This is a 200 cell tray, so there's 200 individual slots. And basically what we wanna do is we wanna go from here to one of these larger pots uh, through our transplanting step. And we want one transplanting step throughout the entire uh, more uh, uh, early season, right before we transplant into the garden, again, to reduce labor requirements. So we'll fill this with soil and what we do is basically we don't, we use the very top uh, for plant labels, which we'll show you. And what we try to do is we, on the horizontal side, we will plant seeds for uh, one given kind of plant. And what we do is basically for one six pack, we grow this many plants, that's nine, right? So we always grow nine plants for every six pack that we wanna produce. And that way we can pick the best genetics and we can choose the, the strongest plants. Yes, we end up killing some of our seeds, but seeds are cheap, right? So we'll fill this up and, and based on our seeding schedule, which we publish ours on our website, um, and there's also lots of them that you can use around town. Hometown has some and uh, Community Extension has them. Um, basically, you plant based on your seeding schedule. And then once the plants mature, that's when we are not mature, but uh, once you get your first true leaf is when we decide to transplant to one of these larger pots. So what we would say is that almost all of our plants that we create are going to be transplanted into a 606 jumbo insert, almost everything, flowers, herbs, practically everything that we grow. But sometimes, again, wanting one transplant step, we decide to transplant to a three and a half inch pot. This is what we use for like tomatoes and peppers. Um, we're, we're going to talk a little bit about what we also use these for, but larger plants are good for a three and a half inch pot. We never transplant directly into this. We'll talk about this. Basically what this is, is a late season uh, pot that we can use to transplant plants that were in the three and a half inch pot into a larger pot. And that gives them more room to grow. We can grow, you know, very large plants. We can start our tomatoes in, in 10 weeks before the last frost. Uh, and we can give them more and more soil to grow into and get larger. Um, we do use these larger pots for a few different kinds of plants. So uh, particularly large plants, uh, your seeds. cucurbits, uh, large seeds, pumpkins, squash, uh, cucumber, um, uh, melons, uh, those kinds of large things, we directly seed into one of these. And the reason is, is that often we can get that seed to germinate and grow all the way up to the transplanting time because typically you're growing the, or starting those four to five weeks uh, above or before last frost. So we'll directly uh, transplant into that or, or directly sow into the three and a half inch pots. As we get into like May, what we start to see sometimes, especially with plants that we've grown in these pots is that they'll start to dry out very quickly. Um, the the, when that happens, basically, that's our signal to transplant up to one of these larger pots. And what we can tell you is that you put a plant in one of these, they will use every bit of that soil. So it may seem excessive, but the plants will use it if you give it to them. Um, so that's kind of our, our process. We do have another pot here, uh, and this is not related to, to seed germination or and seed starting. But we do use these one gallon pots. If you participate in like the Fairbanks soil and water conservation plant sales and you get a bunch of perennials uh, that you bring home all at once, we fill these up with soil and plant our perennials in these pots just temporarily. So it gives us much more time to actually plant those into our yard. So if you're doing perennials, this is a really good uh, uh, pot size to have around. So we wanna talk about watering. Uh, seedlings because that's always a challenge especially when you get dozens of these trays going on and this is what we've settled on so a lot of people use uh, regular sprayers that kind of stuff we did that for years and then we found this thing and this thing is life-changing so this is a pressure sprayer and you can find them at Home Depot and Lowe's they're about seven bucks 
and you pump them up and basically then you can just press the the button and it's going to give you a fine mist of water uh, over your plant. So it's great for seedlings, right? Where you can uh, easily water, you know, all of your seedlings all at once and it's very easy on your hands. And then when we have a bunch of plants with these inserts or pots, we don't actually go and water the tops of the plants. We use what's called sub-irrigation or bottom watering, right? Where we actually will fill the tray with the water. So it's important to have trays that don't have holes in them in that case. Um, but we will fill the water with, or the fill the tray with water. And basically what's gonna happen is the water will wick into all of that soil. And it really doesn't matter if you overwater or underwater, the, the water will be taken up in a certain amount. And then if there's excess, you can just simply dump out any excess water after about an hour or two and all of that water has been absorbed. And that will give you the perfect amount of water for your plants. So, and again, that's really important from a, a larger scale of garden, right? Where you're growing hundreds of different things. You need very quick ways of doing things. Um, so, uh, one of the other tools that we use is basically a seeder. Uh, some seeds are very easy to manipulate. They're, they're super easy to pick up and put into dirt and that kind of thing. But these seeders are super handy for very small seeds. And basically what they allow you to do is put some seeds in this, in this clear part and then you can kind of tap uh, and knock the seeds down. There's little graduations in here that basically slow the, the process of those seeds so you don't just dump a bunch of seeds into your uh, soil. So this is really good for controlling very small seeds uh, we even use this for direct sows of like carrots and other things. And then another thing we have is a little eyeglass screwdriver. And what we use this for is basically to remove the plug. Once we have, uh, you know, we want to transplant out of this into a larger container, we use this to kind of go down the sides of the, of the seating tray and pull that plug out. And then we have a nice plug that we can then put into one of the other uh, containers, whichever we're going to do. So it's pretty fast, like the mm -hmm. transplanting, because most of these are about finger. It's basically you just can poke, plant, poke, plant, poke, plant, give them a little push and like a slight little type top water and then just predominantly bottom water. Mm -hmm. But yeah, you have to think about if you're transplanting hundreds of plants, um, doing it quickly um, and that you don't cause as much plant stress. But um, they're pretty resilient. You can be a little rough with them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she actually worked in a commercial greenhouse for a while, so she's taught me a lot of tricks. Like, I, I'm more of the, the <laughs> grower and the gardener, but she's actually done this professionally, so I've learned a lot from her. Um, so, uh, one other thing we want to show you is kind of our seed storage method. Again, when you grow hundreds of plants, you tend to have lots of seeds, and I know everybody in this room uh, probably has lots of seeds. Uh, this is what we've settled on. It has changed our life. This is called a photo organizer and basically it's designed for storing lots of photos, right? Works perfect for seed packets. And I want to show you a couple things about this. So it first it keeps all our seeds dry and, and uh, in good shape. And what we've done is we've labeled each and every container with the type of uh, seed that it is. So we've got allium, greens, peas and beans, brassicas, you know, the major categories of seeds so we know where everything is. And then we've also uh, printed out these uh, little inserts that we have in the top and this is the seed viability. So we always have a very quick reference of how long the seeds could be expected to last. Seeds do have a lifespan. Different seeds have different lifespans. Uh, and we do go into that topic a lot more in depth on our website, but basically th these are estimates, right? They're not they're not perfect. So, um, but this allows us to assess our seeds. And then the other thing that we do is that on every seed packet, we write the year that we bought those seeds. And so that way, when we typically in the early season, like right about now, we go through our, our seed packs, packets when we're trying to do, put together our seed order and we look for old seeds and things that we might want to replace. And what this storage method has done for us Back before we did this, we used a big shoebox and all that, and we were constantly buying seeds, 
that we had already had that we didn't need to replace. We couldn't find them, you know, when we were trying to look for them, we'd have to shuffle through them like, where's that parsley, you know? Um, and so this allows us very easy organization and it scales to hundreds of packets of seeds. We actually use two, this is our vegetable one, but we also have one for flowers. And that one we categorize just by the, the letters of the, of the class of flower that it is. So, you know, viola is under V and so on and so forth. Um, and then the last thing I wanna talk about is kind of our, our lighting equipment and that kind of thing. So um, in general, we, if you're gonna do indoor seating, we do recommend generally around room temperatures. And the reason that we recommend that is because some seeds will not germinate in cooler temperatures. So if you have a garage or something like that and you've struggled with seeds germinating, chances are it could be related to the temperature. They do make heating mats and that kind of thing but I wanna kinda of talk about how, how we do our grow rooms um, because they're, they're not huge, they're very, they can be permanent, they can be temporary, uh, but what we do is basically we have a two by six table that we temporarily set up for this particular season. We also have an actual grow tent and everything like that that we use, but we're not gonna talk about that. Um, the, uh, that table can hold up to eight of these or yeah, eight of these 10, 20 trays. So it's really popular for a lot of gardeners to do shelf-based systems, trying to get a lot of scale into shelving, right? What we've found, we've done it both ways, right? And we, we prefer a single plane of growing as opposed to having shelves and that kind of thing. And the reasons that we like a, a flat table is because we can very easily assess all of our plants. We can see everything. We can tell if, they're, if they don't have water or they do have water. We can detect problems with our plants much quicker and solve those issues. Uh, and plus, it looks really cool to have a really big table full of uh, uh, plants, right? So um, when, when you're trying to light a larger space like that, it requires some pretty good indoor lighting, right? So, and if you're in the north up here and you're paying our utility rates, what I'll tell you is that LEDs are where it's at, right? So you can be using compact fluorescence or HID or other types of lighting, but you will eventually save money in about three years if you switch to LED. It's, it's quite incredible. And we've done the math, we've measured the electricity, we know that for a fact. So we strongly recommend LEDs. Um, we've actually brought a couple of our, our lights. Um, so this is my current favorite lighting. This is called a quantum board. And what this is, is basically an, uh, it's got an LED driver on the back, which is how this is powered. And it's a board with a bunch of different LEDs on it. And essentially this gets plugged in and it's got a nice little hanger here that you can hang from, we just build a, PVC based light hanger, right? And we can, and, and then I'll use a light hanger to bring this up or down. And what's great about this light is this particular footprint, it will cover a three foot by three foot area and a three foot by three foot area evenly. You will get very good dispersion of light. What we've found with a lot of compact fluorescent lights is that they are really good at providing light directly below it but the light disperses quite heavily as you get out. And light intensity is incredibly important for seed starting. If you get less light intensity, your, your plants will become leggy because what they're trying to do is seek the light. And leggy plants, I'm sure a lot of you in this room have tried you know, to grow in less than ideal conditions and you find that you have spindly plants and then you put them in the ground and they just fall over and they don't do anything. When you have really good distribution of lighting, you get very compact plants, you get very high quality garden starts, just like you would buy from a greenhouse. This lighting, uh, that light will use about 90 watts. Uh, and if you think about that, if we have two over a two by six table, you're talking about 180 watts. Comparable lighting to cover that large of an area with compact fluorescent lights will be about 280 watts. So that's going to have a measurable impact on your, on your power bill, and it's crazy how quickly it pays off when you're paying 28 cents a kilowatt hour. So 
Um, but that's our favorite lighting, but lots of different LED lights are out there. Um, this is an example of an LED light that we got at Home Depot. And what's cool about this light, this is kind of our emergency light. And what we do is if we run out of space indoors and say we need to get a little uh, seedling tray going with light, we can just literally take this and put it right over the humidity dome and it provides very high quality lighting for just a single seating tray. So we, we do have a couple of these and they're super handy to have around um, because sometimes we, you know, frankly run out of room, you know, in April and May, uh, the weather's not cooperating, we can't put our plants outside yet. Uh, and so this light has gotten us by in a lot of different cases where um, we've needed some additional space but don't have options, right? So we do use both of these. Um, again, that's called a quantum board. It's my favorite kind of LED lighting right now. It's, it's also what's called full spectrum. So it's not, um, uh, it's not called blurple, right? That purple kind of lighting that you see a lot. It's more of a natural kind of light and it's tuned specifically for the frequencies that plants are going to consume. So, uh, and then, and this one is actually made uh, by a company called Horticultural Lighting Group. Uh, they're a US based company. They make these products here. Um, we do focus a lot on US based products and that's what we like to buy. Uh, Bootstrap Farmer makes some great stuff. They're who makes our, uh, our seating trays and our 1020 trays. They're a, a US based company. They've moved all their manufacturing to the US uh, and a good company to work with. Unfortunately, they're not very friendly to uh, Alaska in shipping. Uh, and as you can imagine, when you buy 30 trays, right, it's not, you're, you're paying 75 bucks to get it up here. But um, the fact that this stuff will last for 20 years, it's worth it to us. So, um, but anyway, that, uh, oh, and one other piece, uh, this is a timer. So uh, in general, we recommend about 14 to 16 hours a day of, of indoor lighting. Um, and basically you can buy these little timers uh, that will turn the lighting on and off automatically for you. Um, you can set it to go over the night or over the day. We choose the night because it allows us to come home, check on our plants and do any, any uh, stuff that we need to do. Plus it provides us a little bit of heat in, in the spring uh, overnight and that's a benefit up here. So, cause these lights can get pretty warm. Um, one other thing I do wanna mention if you are interested in these uh, quantum boards, they're extremely powerful lights. They can burn your plants, they can kill your plants. So you need about two feet uh, between your plants and the actual lighting. And doing that, you'll get about three to four times the amount of light that you can get from a similar compact fluorescent. So, but it's fully safe on plants. And again, I love these lights. They're great and they're not very expensive. They're about 150 bucks a piece, which is very comparable to compact fluorescence and other, other types of light that you might be able to buy. So that's pretty much uh, the presentation, but any questions? You can, uh, if you have an actual AC, you know, conversion process, um, you know, you, you need AC power. So those aren't DC powered, uh, but I don't see any reason why you couldn't h hook it up to an off grid electrical situation, you know, preferably with batteries, but also a solar panel. You wouldn't want, LEDs are actually quite uh, resilient to fluctuations in power. But I haven't personally done any testing. Like if you went low on the power and de didn't deliver enough power to them, would it hurt them? I don't know. Yeah. Do you use um, fans or anything like that? Mm -hmm. We do. Yeah, we have a couple clip-on fans. And again, we built a PVC-based light hanger that we just put over our table. And we clip a couple of uh, small personal fans over or on either end to kind of keep air moving around. And in our grow room, we actually do that. We circulate air inside the grow tent. And then we also have a fan that evacuates air out of the grow tent to keep it uh, at a perfect temperature. And we'll like brush them too, just to help them kind of grow mm -hmm. stronger. Right, yeah, simulating wind. Mm -hmm. So how long do you leave those humidity domes on so typically um, only when they're in the seedling tray and then right after we transplant into, you know, one of these, these larger uh, pots, you, we only leave the humidity dome on for maybe two to three days after we do the transplant and then they never get the humidity dome after that. And then they have the access to the moving air that they need. Exactly, correct.
And it helps in case like you get algae growth or whatnot, which is common yep. if you use these for too long. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, because if you trap the moisture, you, you're more you'll get moss and other stuff that grows on there. Right. That's where these vents are really handy and that kind of thing. Yep. Wait, could you could you go over the watering on the ten twenty tray again? You pull sure. the plants out and then add. Typically, what we'll do so um, so we'll remove just one. Of the, tr of the trays, so imagine, you know, we didn't want to bring a ton of stuff here, but imagine we've got an entire tray filled with these. What we'll do is we'll remove one mm -hmm. and we'll use a watering can to fill up to maybe halfway uh, through the, um, or to the halfway up the sides of the tray. And go like that too. Yep. So then you just have a little area that you can um, take your watering can and insert and so you don't disturb them too much. But typically we're putting like a quarter gallon, you know, maybe even a half gallon in some cases of water into, and, and when you do this a lot, you really get familiar with how much your plants uh, will use water at different stages of their life. Obviously when they are freshly transplanted, they don't consume as much water. When they're deeply rooted and, and you know, we're almost to planting time, they suck down a lot of water, so. And you can check them, like what's nice on a table setting, mm -hmm. you just kind of give them a quick little tip and you'll over time you'll get used to what is a properly watered tray and you can know by weight if that tray is good or if it needs watering right. so that's a really quick way to just like check and see if there's any individual trays that need a watering so again reducing your labor and one thing we do a lot of is we'll often like if certain plants are taking more water we'll try to organize a tray based on similar water uptake needs and that way the entire tray is consistent because what we don't want is for one very moist tray uh, to be among a bunch of very dry trays or, or uh, inserts or, or pots. Um, because what that means is if we put a bunch of water in it, we're watering already well watered plants. So we try to get consistency of how much water the, the individual plants are using um, in the same tray so that we have consistent water uptake. I have a couple questions. larger um, absolutely not okay. um, the reason that we don't just seed directly into these right. is we want a full six pack every mm -hmm. single time so what can happen is if you have seed germination problems or you know just some of your seeds don't come up you can end up getting one or two of these spots that don't end up having a plant and to me that's a waste of space I'm, a, I'm an engineer so like <laughs> I'm super precise about a lot of different things um, and that bothers me, right? That's an, it's an OCD thing. But if it didn't bother you, there's absolutely no worries about uh, seeding directly into a, an insert. For flowers, a benefit to doing um, the seedling plug and then moving into a larger six pack uh, container is like, let's say you have a mix mm -hmm. and they'll have maybe different qualities that you can observe in that seedling. And so maybe you wanna make sure you're getting a diverse six pack. So that way it lets you kind of pick from what you have there. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. What I found, what I do with the plugs is when I first, I put, I use seeding to mix, mm -hmm. starting mix, mm -hmm. and then um, I make sure it's moist, and then I put my seeds in, mm -hmm. but then I put plastic wrap on top, mm -hmm. sure. just for anywhere from three to five days, mm -hmm. until I just see a little yep. bit of green, and then I pull them right. off. Mm -hmm. So it keeps that moisture yeah. in there. So yeah. It seems to really help it. Yeah, that works. And what, what we would tell you is that, again, these are Bootstrap Farmer uh, uh, products. They're very well made. These trap serious moisture. So, I mean, we have humidity going in these, like there's water droplets over the whole thing. Yeah, constantly. Because uh, there's a very good seal between the tray and everything. So no escape of moisture. Uh, it's very similar to using plastic wrap. And then I use wrap. the domed after that. Yep, mm -hmm. sure. Because yeah. it adds some extra air, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. moisture, yeah. Uh, extra air circulation. Yep. But just to begin with, I just use regular old plastic or ceramic. Right. Mm -hmm. And like you'll see, um, they'll sell like a shorter humidity dome. Mm -hmm. We really like the taller ones because your plants can, within a day, they can hit that top. Yep. Um, and so, to, especially when we do onions. Yep. Um, so, this one is really great when you have like 
200 onions you have to see. <laughs> yeah, which is what we do. <laughs> you just keep going, and, and that this is really helpful. Um, if I just have to see like one row of something, I won't bust this out. But like if you have to do a lot, it's helpful just to um, make sure you're getting one into an area. If we have a seed that is a little older and we're like kind of questionable on the viability, maybe it's at the end of it, we might just do a double. And then if both plants come up, we'll just sniff them with a, one of them with a sniff. And don't pull it out because that'll disrupt the root system. Mm -hmm. But you can just clip it, like the onion ones, you can just eat them. A lot of them you can eat, so it's kind of mm -hmm. like a nice little snack yeah. for your efforts. Like tiny microgreens, yeah. So for plants that need light to germinate, mm -hmm. um, how do you manage keeping that surface? Moist? So we always germinate on, under light. Um, there are some plants that require light to germinate. There are no plants that don't require light to germinate. So all seeds, we haven't found a single one that will not germinate under light. So we apply light to every single plant that we grow. So you don't seed and then put nope. potting nope. soil or... No, we, we seed directly into these trays. They go on our tables under lighting, and, and they're in there with the rest oh, of our plants. So as and far as like the depth of the seeding? Yeah, the depth sure. of the seed. Sure, so your, your seed pack, packet will describe what they recommend. Right. I mm -hmm. think this typically rule of thumb is it's like twice or three times the diameter of the seed. Yeah. Um, so take it very seriously when the seed packet says, do not cover. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Have you ever, mm -hmm. do you like do grow uh, snapdragons or, uh, because I've mm -hmm. seen people covering it with vermiculite. Mm -hmm. why, why does that work, you know? But so some seeds do, are best covered. So mm -hmm. some will say, do not cover, don't cover those. Some require a certain amount of depth. And usually what we do is, is if we have a particularly deep-rooted or a deep-seeded uh, seed, we'll push a pretty good hole into these to kind of get some depth. And then we come across them and we just we put the soil to bring it back up to the top. For most of our plants, we fill this the seeding tray all the way up and we'll just lightly dust uh, some additional soil over the, crop, over the top of it. You know, maybe an eighth of an inch, a quarter inch, that kind of thing. So... You, we kind of we do follow those guidelines of how deep to plant a seed, but most of it's done by surface seeding and then putting soil over those particular right. seeds. I've just had problems with germination with like snapdragons mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. you can't cover at all and managing the moisture. So. Right. And for that, it might be better to maybe not bring that into the rest of your seeding. You know, we have grown some things, particularly like perennials and that kind of thing where we have to treat them very differently. You know, maybe we have to scarify the seeds um, or strad, you know. Chill them or yeah, soak them. Yeah, right. Like, so Oftentimes we'll grow those separately. Exactly. Okay. But this is universal. I mean, you could grow them. I mean, we've grown lupine like this. We've grown all sorts of things. But if you're having troubles, maybe isolate it a little bit and, and just treat it separately. And that way you always know, like, hey, this is what's going on here. You don't accidentally put a bunch of soil on okay. seeds that don't want it. But the bulk of your vegetable seeds can, they're not very fussy in, in what they require. But yeah, we, we have a few kind of like anomalies that we just have to treat differently. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think you had a question. Yes. Um, I've never successfully done a tomato plant very well. Mm -hmm. I, even though I've started inside. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was watching a video and I wanted to ask your experience on uh, what the, the guy said was he had like the red Dixie cups mm -hmm. and he started his seed with half of the half of the soil mm -hmm. and then you talked about the first leaves uh, mm -hmm. when you, when you mm -hmm. transplant from one container to the other you mm -hmm. want to those first leaves are not the, the yeah, actual plant leaves yep. mm -hmm. they're the seed leaves yep. and then he, he said and I just don't know if this is true because I want to try it mm -hmm. um uh, he said that when you, you, you the the cups will come in handy later. Mm -hmm. I think he tra he started like that. Mm -hmm. Then he transplanted into a Dixie red Dixie cup mm -hmm. about half full. Yep. Then he, he cut off those leaves mm -hmm. and, and then he, filled it up with soil. And, and he kept cutting until it got up. And but he kept putting a little bit of mm -hmm. dirt on yep. top of it. And I think if I understood what he said correctly. He said that if you give it a good a tomato plant a good root system, mm -hmm. 
you will have a better plan mm -hmm. and better. Now, is that something that you, it looks like to me, you're right on, on target with it, everything that I've learned a little bit, you know, mm -hmm. so is that the way that y'all do it? We I mean, don't do it exactly that way, um, but what he's telling you is, act, is very true. So mm -hmm. what will happen is all nightshades, it's not just tomato plants, all nightshades, will actually grow roots out of the, the stem it's if it's covered with soil. So every, you know, huckleberries, eggplants, um, uh, ground cherries, potatoes, tomatillos, right? potatoes, mm -hmm. all of them do that. And, uh, and that's a characteristic of, of nightshades. So that is absolutely true. The, but we don't, uh, we don't go through and like cut the leaves off or anything like that. What we do is we sow our tomatoes in our seeding tray just like every other plant. Then we'll transplant them into this pot. And what we, we do usually bury the stem. You know, that's what yeah, we call it, bury the stem a little bit. Just as deep as you can. Um, and so we will uh, typically uh, you know, put it to where there's still a, some plant on the top. And then we'll fill this the the whole container with soil, and then mo usually with tomatoes we end up transplanting to this larger pot. So we do that again. So usually in sometime in May, right, we're going to transplant out of this into this guy to give us a little bit more time. And again, what we want to do often, what we'll do is we'll imagine you know this was a plant, right? We would just put it all the way at the bottom, and put dirt around the sides and again it's going to grow out so you don't take it out of the container oh yeah, yeah. yeah no we do take it out i was like imagine this is the plant right um, it'll be really root bound by that point mm -hmm. too so it's easy to just like pop them off throw them down to the bottom one of you can hold it and you can just throw the soil on pack yep. it around and does that we, actually mm -hmm. produce more tomatoes it it does help and then there's actually one more step that we do. We grow our tomatoes in containers, um, so five gallon buckets. We use a sub irrigation system. They'll you can learn about them. Greenhouse. Yeah, that we put them in the greenhouse, but mm -hmm. we do that again. So we'll have this, and we take the plant out and we bury it deeply into the container. And so we do we do that like three or four times, but we don't even cut off the stems and all that business. They'll just die underground, right? Okay. So it doesn't it doesn't really matter. Thank you. Yeah. No, typically it just goes in our grow room. Um, seeds don't really need to be uh, stored in the cold. Like generally dark and cool-ish is good. We keep our house at like 65 degrees. We've never had That's any issues with, cool. what's that? That's considered cool? I would consider that yeah. cool enough yeah. for seed storage. Okay, so when you're doing your seedlings, do you have to put a heater in that room? We, we typically don't because our lighting produces like, yeah. a fair bit of heat. Um, okay. We actually do all of our germination in our grow tent, which is tightly climate controlled, so we can keep it at like 70 degrees, which is perfect for pretty much every type of seed. But if you didn't have that, we might recommend a seeding heat mat. Um, and again, it's you know kind of like how we, we mentioned with seed germination and lighting, uh, there are seeds that, that germinate in cooler temperatures, but it were that will not germinate in cooler temperatures, but there are a few seeds that will not germinate in warmer temperatures. Mm -hmm. So generally, if you can keep it at about 70 degrees, between 70 and 75, all seeds will germinate. And then my other question was, um, with the quantum board, mm -hmm. how close do you put that to the seedlings and then you have to keep moving it up? About 24 inches. Um, and and it's again because that's a very powerful very light uh so you, you need distance uh because it will kill that thing on your phone what's that called what's that that checks the lights oh yeah i use what's called a lux meter on my phone it's an app you can call you can see it and generally we try to target about uh 20 to twenty five thousand lux uh at the top of the plants what i would tell you is that as plants mature they can take more and more light right and if you think about it the lux out here is is a lot more it could be 50 80 thousand plants are fine with that and so as that we don't really move the lighting a lot and we'll just let them grow into the light if we start to notice tip burn or anything like that or, or issues with the uh the acceptance of the amount of light we might deal with it then but for the most part the plants will grow into the light and accept the new amount of light that they get at higher higher levels so we rarely change the height of our lighting yeah. 
lux meter. What was the number again? Uh, between 20 and 25,000 is what we target. And you'll never see that out of a compact fluorescent. You can only see that out of out of higher end LEDs like we've talked about. I think Dana has a yeah. Really good do question. I no, that's a great question. I I had that on my notes and I stopped looking at my notes. So, uh, talking about fertilization, right? It is very important. What what I'll tell you is that we never fertilize anything in this plant or in the seedling tray. Uh, those are all grown based on the the natural uh, sugars and everything that the seed actually has and maybe a little bit of, of uh, the soil that we use, right? Once we do transplant, we do start to fertilize probably about two to three weeks after we've transplanted. Um, and w the general guideline that we use for fertilizer, basically we use the same exact watering technique. We usually will use plain water, but when we fertilize, we basically put, uh, we use a liquid soluble fertilizer, specifically a water soluble fertilizer, and we'll just make up a, a watering can of that uh, water and we'll do the same thing where we bottom water our plants and they get infused with fertilizer that way. Uh, a general guideline for seedling fertilization amounts is about a quarter dose of a full strength dose. So not every fertilizer will indicate how much to use in, on seedlings, but about a quarter dose is consistently what we've seen as an acceptable uh, level. We absolutely love water soluble uh, fertilizers. We use that across all, all of our gardens. Um, I'll also say we are not shy to say that we are not organic gardeners. Uh, we like uh, the power of good quality blue crystal magic. Um, if the plants didn't like it, they wouldn't respond the way they do and ours get huge. And and we just, I don't know, organic has, has we shifted. We started out. Yeah, we started out that way a long time ago, and, and we've shifted to non-organic. Um, we Organic means a lot of different things, right? And we practice a lot of organic techniques, but we don't um, in, in regard to fertilizer. So we use chemically derived fertilizer. And basically, we only have 100 days to grow. So right. It's, probably, it's really difficult to yep. be organic. And they exactly. have a great um, article on their website about that. Yep. Yeah, it's why we don't practice organic gardening. We had so. the conversation about what was most important and the work and the time you put in. And you'll find mm -hmm. that, especially if you're a new gardener, that it can get overwhelming. It is a part-time job um, that the yields were so critical. And so we were like, we just want a lot of veg. Yeah. And um, that yeah. harvest switch, is what matters. Doing that switch allowed it. So mm -hmm. I use worms. I, I keep my worms all winter. And then I put those in. Yeah, and we we do that too. Again, we practice some organic things and and not others. We're just we're just not organic purists. So like for pests, like we do beam oil or just physically mm -hmm. squishing the aphid. Um, we've also had really great success this last year. We planted marigolds in our greenhouse mm -hmm. yeah. uh, near the vents, so that we had no aphid issues this right. year. So calendula works mm -hmm. really yeah. well too. Yeah, mm -hmm. we grow uh, calendula calendula in our container gardens, and mm -hmm. it's. It's a good yeah, pest deterrent. Mm -hmm. So when it, excuse me. Yeah. Um, so when it comes to harvest, I assume that you're selling your product. No, no, so we. Planning and preserving all mm -hmm. of this. Yep. Right. Yeah. So so. We do give stuff away, and yeah. you know, like everybody. So are you gonna? So. I've also had a problem mm -hmm. with preserving mm -hmm. when I've tried it. Um, the I university probably, has such a great. I was real disappointed in my dehydrator. 
But I did do some shell chips, which made a lot of, uh, and I saturated, you know, I put some uh, olive oil on it, and some of that uh, yeast, uh, fruit, knit fruit, mm -hmm. nutritional mm -hmm. yeast, yeah. nutritional yeast. Mm -hmm. It was delicious, yeah. and you know what? I kept those, I kept those for uh, two years. Right. Mm -hmm. They were delicious. Yeah. And they did not go bad. The oil wasn't bad or anything. Right. Yeah. Great. And Speaking of drawing, I'm really interested in freeze drawing. Mm -hmm. Have you guys tried that? We have not. Um, we our heaviest uh, use of preservation is a technique called blanch and freeze, and. Uh, we have an article on our website. The University of Minnesota it has great community extension information on it. Um, that's as far as we've gone into it. Um, and the university, I, I took a class through University Southeast, um, and they covered all of that in their online yeah. course on food preservation. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And, and they're offering it again this year. And they talked about freeze dry. They talk about freeze dry. They talk about all different mm -hmm. kinds of preservation. Mm -hmm. And also, like a simple thing is just thinking about the varieties that you're growing to. Some are more susceptible to to longer storage periods. There's even storage tomatoes out there um, that will store shelf on the shelf for two to three months. I'm still eating mm -hmm. cabbage. Mm -hmm. so. We still have some squash. Yeah. And, yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Well, thank you yeah. so much. Our pleasure. This was amazing. <laughs> No, we want we want inundation. Go to our website, follow us on social media, yeah. <laughs> like and subscribe or whatever. We're on Facebook, Instagram, and Pinterest. Thank you so much. Yeah. You know, we've thought about.